moments of embarrassment were that I couldn't tell anybody, any other SEALs, that we were building a new command, even SEALs that were senior to me. Uh, just one day I showed up and I was told I could take pick of the litter of anybody I, I wanted, which didn't make anybody happy. And uh, I guess I, I always say that I'm a hell of a brain server, but I do flunk bedside manner. So I, I didn't do it with the social graces. Um, my bad, but I'm good at that. But in another, I would say another dichotomy in this whole thing is if I go back to Vietnam, Admiral Zumwalt was Naval Forces Vietnam, who was became Chief of Naval Operations. He jumped like 25 admirals to become CNO. And he was the one that said there will be Z-grams and, and the guys could wear pork chops and you know the hair growth was authorized, the, the new Navy. Well, coming out of Nam and, and I now went back to Cambodia and then I came in to be commander of SEAL Team 2. And Admiral Zuma was almost ready to get out, but he had alienated a lot of admirals. So when I took over SEAL Team 2, I told him no more mustaches, no more beards, and we're going back to sidewalls and military. And of course, that was went down like <laughs> fart in church. But I'd come through the ranks, they knew me, and you know, what, what were they going to say? So there I'm, here I am saying, everybody's going to have a haircut. Then here comes Dick Marcinko, la, forming a new organization. And I said, and don't get another haircut. If you want to put an earring in, you may. Facial hair is going to be in. And everybody's going, <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, well, you know, what happened to this squirrel? So it was really, a, it was a kind of a shock. And then I, um, in my staff tours, I had, had visited GSG-9, and I knew General Wagner, and saw the mechanisms of what was going on, and, and learned about black bag funding, uh, working in the Pentagon, and, and all the funny ops that were going down. So I, I, forming SEAL Team 6 was basically my military thesis. Every dirty trick I think I could pull, I did it to do that. So that's why, I mean, you can't, if you have a four hour window, when somebody blows a whistle, says four hours, you get to the airport, you're not gonna grow hair. And, and I've had, I had senior and SEAL officers tell me, buy them wigs. And I could just see going through the window, going through the door, my wig come off, say, excuse me. But, you know, it was just ludicrous. It, it was, it was just so, Opposing to what everybody was used to, and uh, and of course we put, I put everybody in civilian clothes, so everybody wore civilian clothes, and uh, everybody everybody got pick of the litter in terms of weapons, and a normal SEAL command. In fact, I just read recently there's a shortage of weapons, so they're doing it again. But anyway, the armory keeps all the guns and the diving locker keeps all the lungs and the air ops keeps all the parachutes. And when you go on operation, you go and you draw what you need and you go to deploy. Well, six, I bought everybody their own set of pistols and their own MP5 and their own parachute and their own Draeger. And then I gave them, I built them a 10 by 10 cage. And that was their, their locker. It was a cage so they could step in it and I can go by and see what was there. So everybody had their own skis, their own snow, you know. It was all there for me to see. And they all, so it was no, no one could say. Uh, it came out of the locker and it didn't work right. It's your gear, it's your locker. So now the, the weakest link is the man. So no more, you cut down excuses. And uh, not everybody can, you know, is, is an expert on, on all, all the weapons and all the, all the parachutes. So within every boat crew or unit that functioned, there was somebody that was a specialist that could guide and, and say, well, this is how you got to fix this. So, you know, it, it, it was just a, 
That's why you call it a team. But that you know that the fact of, of the the longer hair, civilian dress, owning your own equipment, and then having to respond uh, quick. I mean, the when we started, it was September one of nineteen eighty. They said man it, and I commissioned it operationally ready to go. 31 December. So the troops averaged over 200 days a year on the road, and I did over 300. Just going from rock climbing to snow operations, and I think that one of the hardest things in my mind to get a SEAL to do is doing Arctic operations, downhill, cross country, all that, all that fun but trying to tell them that when he gets in a snow cave at night, he has to take his clothes off. They don't like doing it. This, until, they, until they understand it, when that clothes gets sweaty, you step out, you know, in bad juju, and you end up shaping with that ice. But it just, it's just unnatural. And if you think about wars, we as a nation haven't fought very many cold wars. And uh, not many people think about that wire snaps and you need different kind of grease and, and it's just miserable. Well, you know, in the summertime, you can, you can think about cold beer and, and you, can out, you can find water some, or something wet to cool you down a little bit. In fact, Vietnam, as warm as it was there, you, just, you, get, a, you get a storm, that, that storm, I mean, I got chills. Yeah. And, and, and working in the Delta, the tides would change 12 feet. So you could be in the high ground waiting for Charlie to come by to shoot. Next thing you know, you're up to your chin in water. And it's uh, like, this sucks. So there's, you know, just things to get, you have to get used to. But the, again, back to six, the, the, the pace was different and, and how they functioned. I mean, it's kind of stupid when you think about most people would go to Navy Special Warfare because they don't want to go to ships. They don't like ships. Not even love boats. But the, uh, you, you tell them, you say that, that they don't want to, but to join six, we started off with Boston Whalers. And then we went to ribs as we start building raiding craft that could keep the pace and go out there to race across the ocean in a small boat to take down a love boat or an oiler or a nuclear carrying weapon ship. I mean, it's just sheer, it, it's like, it's like looking at the old Marlboro ads of the boat breaking over the ocean. But here are these guys, I mean, it, it is, it is ridiculous. And I can tell you, you can get hurt uh, riding those small boats. And sometimes it's the whip of the antenna coming down, hitting you over your head. As we progress, we put shock absorbers on, this, on the seats and went to stand-up seats like the roller coasters today because it was just beating our spines. But you're going, you know, and every ocean has, every ocean has its own rhythm. Um, one because of the depth and, and, and the wind, but you get to, you get to feel it. And uh, I can tell you, riding a boat out to, to take down a ship that's doing 20 knots, catching up with it, getting a hook on it to climb up and looking at that screw going chikunk, 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 thinking if you fall off that little ladder, bad juju, and one, you've been beat to hell, and you're carrying weapons, and you're ready to go, so as soon as you break the rail, take down somebody, hit a three by five card over a heart, or a three by five card over a brain, you're wired. And uh, it's a, Takes a lot of focus and a lot of training, and you, you know, and I always thought that that was getting men that didn't want to go to sea to go to sea in rubber boats seemed a, you know, kind of, kind of a trick.